I'm aggravated. I've been having a hard time dialing into the right frame of mind or mood or whatever to to make the videos that I want to make lately for about a week or so and it's it's driving me nuts the first dozen or so just kind of fell together I'm having trouble hitting the zone. Uh, I know from past, well, I know from experience with other creative things that I've played around with that it's a cycle and it'll, it'll come back around, you know. Um, but it's just, it's irritating right now. So. You have an idea in your head and you pursue it, you go after it, and, and after a while, you're adhering to the idea so stringently that you um, you lose the juice, man. You lose the, the motivation to do it. It doesn't, the freshness is gone, and all you've got is, is the uh, ritual of it. And it's hard to... Um, it's hard to be authentic then. You're relying solely on form, format. Routine. And I think that's where I'm at. I think that's where I'm getting with this thing. Um, with the videos, I mean. It's all right. The solution is to carry on until the cycle makes its turn, you know, and, uh, and it feels juicy again. Something very interesting happened today that I'm hoping will help that out. Um, and it relates to my pipe, Samuel. First things, I'm smoking Sam, as per usual. And in him, I have... K's Captain Coffee. Yeah. Uh, which is a house blend from the local tobacco shop. Of course. I'm working on that. My fiance bought Samuel. This is Samuel. This is Sam. Uh, because I bought them both from the same guy. His name is Sam. So this one became Samuel. Um, it's a really pretty pipe, I think. It's unique. The shape of it is just very different. You know, it's got... It's got an interesting angle, like the way that the bowl points, the direction the bowl points in relation to the angle of the stem. It's just kind of different, you know? I wasn't sure that I would like it, but it was curious, it was interesting to me. So I chose this one. It's a Valentine's Day present from my fiance, and I have been using it to test the tobaccos that are harsher, that are a little harder to smoke. And it's easier to sip those tobaccos without them burning really hot. You know, I, I can puff them a little more without them burning hot. A little easier to sip on the tobacco with this pipe than it is with this one. Uh, I'm still learning how to smoke it. I kind of feel like I've hit my limit with what I can learn about this pipe. It's starting to feel restrictive. It's starting to feel like I'm, I'm hitting... Uh, I'm constricted when I'm smoking it. I'm, it's like I'm not getting everything out of the tobacco that I feel like I could be getting. And so, 
I was ready to move on. Um, now I bought, this is the third pipe that I've got. Number two is in the house and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to do a video for that one separate from this video. Um, I just wanted to do this video to give a close-up look at Samuel. And I chose to do that one today because of something very interesting that happened. Now I've mentioned that in making in making these videos and in going through this this process of, of stepping into uh, pipe tobaccos, pipe smoking, I'm kind of I'm kind of trying to avoid as much internet searching as possible, and and uh, it's really tricky to do it. It's really it's so tempting to read um, to get more information to just you know, I have been watching a lot of YouTube videos from other pipers, but I try to draw a line, like, if it comes to someone's opinion of something, what they like or don't like, or if they're just talking about their life or what have you, those things I'll indulge in. If it comes to information that I think I could grab in person, I could learn in person from other people, those are the things I'm trying to avoid. Uh, searching for and looking into online. Kay's Captain Coffee doesn't want to stay lit right now. It's a hard line to walk. It's a hard... I'm kind of on a fence, you know, tightrope sort of thing. I may just give in and say sod it all and and do it anyways. Just let myself look up all the things I want to look up, whatever. I don't know. That whole tack is kind of getting boring. But this pipe had, has Perry 2006 written on it. Right there. And I could not resist looking it up online to find out who made this pipe, right? I figure it's fair game. I'm not really breaking my own rules if I do that, because I did buy the pipe in person. It's not like I bought it online. I did locate a store and go in and peruse the place. And the name's written right there. Um, so I looked into it. And there was nobody, I typed Perry Artisan Pipes, Perry Pipes, tobacco pipes, you know, no hits. I, I didn't get any results on that, but it did bring up a post that someone put on a forum, internet forum, where they said that, um, there was an artisan pipe maker from the United States named Jerry R. Perry out of North Carolina. And this guy said he had bought several pipes from this man over the years. He said he didn't have an internet store, he didn't have he didn't sell any of his pipes online anywhere. As far as he knew, he only sold them at the North Carolina State Fair every year. Um he said the pipes were nice and that they smoked very well, that after twenty years, the ones he had he had bought still smoked nicely. So I typed in the full name this time. Jerry R. Perry tobacco pipes and the only hit that I got was a flyer for the North Carolina Fair that showed that Jerry R. Perry artisan pipe maker had been awarded um, some kind of an award in woodworking that year in woodcraft or woodworking and it included his phone number some contact information now this flyer was about 10 years old and I thought, I, you know, what are the chances? I don't know, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to call this phone number and see if by chance I can get in touch with this Jerry R. Perry pipe maker. And lo and behold, I did. I called him earlier today. He answered the phone and I spoke to him. He was a very nice man. 
um, what he had to say about this pipe and pipes in general was really interesting. I told him who I was and how I had found him. And I described the pipe to him. Which, by the way, makes me think of a, a swan swimming or a, a goose coming into land on water. Right? That's what that... <laughs> that's what that looks like to me. The shape of this reminds me... I look at pipes and I see shapes that remind me of different things. Or just they evoke certain... Um, memories or thoughts. Like, I think Mediterranean when I see this one. I think, like, Middle East or Mediterranean. The word Turkish comes to mind, you know? A region in the world, a geographical region, is what this pipe makes me think of. This one makes me think of an animal. In specific, or in particular, a goose coming into land, flying and coming into land on the water. That's what I see. I think it's beautiful. Um, so, Mr. Perry, who is in his late 70s, told me that after I described the pipe to him, he said, most likely it is a mountain laurel, not briar, but it's made of mountain laurel or cocoa bola. And he believed it was mountain laurel. And he went on to explain that during the Depression, uh, the Great Depression, as opposed to the minor one some of us may have been going through in the past couple years, Briar was not readily available. The First World War had um, I guess destroyed a lot of the production, the manufacturing plants where briar was usually processed and sold to pipe makers. That's how I understood it. Anyway, in the U.S. there was a scarcity of briar and, and pipe makers in the United States started looking for other sources of wood that they could use to make pipes. And they turned to, they tried many different types of wood and settled eventually mainly on two types, Manzanita on the west coast and Mountain Laurel in the Appalachian Mountains on the eastern end of the country. Here on the east side of the country. And they harvested Mountain Laurel for the most part right there within about an hour's drive or so from where he lives. He said that it became very popular and um, they could kind of imitate the aging process or duplicate it in a shorter amount of time um, without actually aging it the way you would typically age briar. Um, they, they could use mountain laurel to age it um, They could age it by boiling the wood, I think, something like that. Uh, they could approximate the same kind of hardness and, 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 and uh, quality that you might get from very old aged wood uh, by cheating it a little bit and speed up the process so that they could crank a lot of pipes out really fast. And um, for a long time, it was used in the U.S. as a replacement for the briar that used to come from overseas. He said that once the briar became available again, they stopped using the mountain laurel almost wholesale. wholesale. They, they, they very quickly and abruptly went back to briar and to ensure that people knew that they were getting the authentic Italian briar, uh, they started making it a point to stamp on their bowls imported briar. So... He said he had been making pipes for about, 
He's been making them for close to 40 years, selling them for 35 plus years at the North Carolina State Fair. And in 1982, he came across someone who had a large surplus of these blocks and burls of mountain laurel that were cut in the year 1930. And this person had worked for one of the factories that was mass producing pipes um, back in the day. And they, I guess he got a good deal on them and he bought a chunk. He bought a lot of this mountain laurel and started making his pipes from mountain laurel. In addition to some briar that he also uses. Um, he does freehand pipes. He said he uses an old technique um, to shape them that, that, uh, that involves something called a French wheel. I haven't really looked into that. But he said no two pipes are exactly alike. He said even if the shape is the same and the pipe looks the same, he said each one is unique. It's, it's, they're, they're, uh, even the ones that aren't completely hand carved are still totally unique. They're, no two are exactly the same. Um, he, has, he bought so much of this mountain laurel in 1982, which was cut around the year 1930, he said. He bought so much of it that he's still going through the stash and making new pipes. He does still make pipes. Now this man does not advertise anywhere. He doesn't even sell at the fair. He said he hasn't sold at the state fair for a couple of years. He only sells to people who know of him and get a hold of him. And he sells out of his house. They come by his home and, and buy them directly from him there. So it's 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 cool because it's kind of like you, you kind of got to know somebody to get in kind of thing, right? Like you have to know this guy and be able to find him to be able to sell these pipes. I, I assume he's not, you know, it's not his sole source of income. But he is still making them regularly. He said he's got about seven or eight uh, that are finished and ready to be sold now. Uh, he's still working on some more. He's in the process of working on others. And he said he's got enough Mountain Laurel to make several more. But he's starting to get to the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. The bottom of the burl. the stomach. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, something's not right with this stuff. It's not tasting right. So, where was I? I told him that I'd like to send him a picture, some pictures of this pipe, and see if he could tell me anything else about it, you know. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and he said he would send me pictures of the ones that he's just finished, the ones that are that are for sale now. He said he has all different kinds. Um, and he said they're, for, they're fair prices. Uh, so I'm very interested to see what else he has, and I'm, I'm waiting on an email now from him. Um, the, the thing that really got me is this. He told me that if this is, as he thinks it is, if, if it's a mountain laurel pipe, then 
the way he put it was, that's a true Appalachian pipe. He said the laurel was cut from right here, you know, over, over an 80 or 90 year period. The laurel was harvested from, from the woods, um, cut into blocks and then crafted into a pipe. All, all within like one county, basically over that length of time, you know, um, he said, as far as he knew, he was the only guy that still made pipes from mountain, the only, uh, from mountain laurel, the only artisan pipe maker who still made them from mountain laurel. And I thought, I didn't ask him about this, but it occurred to me, if he's got that wood that long, it's probably even rarer to find someone who is making pipes with mountain laurel that has been aged that long. Because one of the reasons that they were using it back then was that they could get around the aging, uh, the, the aging process. Well, he hasn't. He's been sitting on it since the 80s. Some of these, these pipes he's just made, you know, he's been sitting on that wood since the 80s. And, and he said the lot that he got it from, he bought it from a man who worked at a factory that was processing, that was making pipes back in the day. And that man assured him these, he knew the date that they were cut. They were all cut in 1930. Um, so probably even rarer to have a pipe that's made from mountain laurel that's actually been aged that long. At any rate, he said that's a true Appalachian pipe. Uh, harvested, cut, crafted right here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and I thought it was interesting because one of the reasons that I started doing this, that I got into pipes, was because I found my great granddad's pipe. And I was looking for some kind of a, a connection to my family roots. And around that same time period, I was going through some old court records in, in the county next door and um, discovered that my family, some 220 years ago, moved into this area and that they came through the Appalachian Mountains down near Cumberland Gap. They, they lived near and passed through the Blue Ridge Mountains, where this mountain laurel would have been harvested. Um, and so it, it, I, I thought it was funny that, that I got into this to try and find, you know, try, try to get some kind of a personal connection with my great-grandfather, to try and, and dig into my own family roots a bit. And I decided to approach buying a pipe and looking for a pipe by sticking to my local community. And in a roundabout way, because I did that, I wound up finding a pipe that was not from the local community, but has ties to, it's from the region that has ties to my family history roots. Um, I don't know if that makes sense the way I put it. It didn't, didn't, you know, come out the way it did in my head when I was thinking about it. But it just seemed a, a funny thing that, that because I chose to go local, I find something that is connected to my roots in an even deeper sense than, than I had expected. And uh, this pipe has even more meaning to me now. It, it's even more special for that reason. Um, it's just cool. Yeah. So I am uh, sent an email off to Jerry Perry waiting to hear back from him and see what else he might have. Um, pretty cool, man. Pretty, pretty cool uh, deal there. But... It's become my go-to Virginia pipe. Um... It helps me smoke the Virginia. I'm trying some different Virginia blends, and this one helps me a lot. To kind of sip on it. This this tobacco is no good. It's the very last bowl of it. I'm glad, because it's gone bad. Something's not right here. It's no good. Um, it's tolerable for right now. 
So anyhow, that's a closer look at Samuel. The pipe my baby bought me on Valentine's Day. Uh, yeah, really nice, nice, and a cool story. You know, this is this is cool. I hope that uh, I hope he's got more that are just as cool. And one of these days, I'd like to make the drive over there to um, to meet him and and. And show him the pipe in person, and uh, I was gonna say maybe get it autographed, but it's already got his name. That's how I found him, because it's got his name on it. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm glad this is the last bowl of this because it's really it's not doing so hot. It's not doing so hot. <laughs> 